ayyuh al-muslimun Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in his most noble book tawakaltu allah have trust in Allah if you are indeed believers we hear this phrase a lot trust in Allah have tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but what does it mean what are its implications in our lives and our, what are the results of having it this is what we'll discuss today shortly inshallah Trust is something you give to someone. But tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trust beyond capabilities to understand why. We trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without knowing the plan. Without knowing, like if you trust someone, you usually have reasons that you trust them. I trust this person because we've done business in the past, you know, and he's always been in right, just right with me. And I trust this person because I've known my Lord. We trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unequivocally. Unequivocally, we trust him with everything. But what are its realities? What are its realities? I'll give you a couple of examples, inshaAllah ta'ala. Because the world right now is crazy. It's crazy. Those of you who are looking what's going on around the world, we're not just talking about in Gaza, we're talking about globally. Globally, the world is upside down. And it does not seem to be getting any better anytime soon. So how do we reconcile this? We see the world is full of darkness. It's full of evil. It's full of oppression. It's full of difficulties. It's full of hardship. It's full of tyrants. It's full of tyranny. How do we reconcile this? with a just Lord. How do we reconcile this with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is Al-Adr? How do we reconcile this with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is Ar-Rahman, who is Al-Latif? How do we reconcile the two? At the time of Musa, السلام, there was a tyrant as well. One of the most famous of all time, Fir'aun, the Fir'aun. There have been many types of pharaohs throughout history, but the Fir'aun, Referred to in the Quran, the Pharaoh at the time of Moses was one of the worst tyrants that the world has ever known. So much so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved him and promised that I would preserve you as a sign to the nations that come after you. And we know today he's still preserved. He's in, he's in, a, he's in a museum in Egypt and he's traveled around the world. He's probably traveled to more countries than most of us. At his time, he had Bani Israel in bondage, in slavery, and they were being persecuted. And for generations, they had been making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them freedom, to send someone to them, to give them some escape. And there was a child born named Musa. And when this child was young, Fir'aun had a dream that there would be one of these children alive right now that would grow up and overthrow him and be his destruction. So what did he do in response? He ordered that all of the young sons of Bani Israel under a certain age be slaughtered. Kill all of them. This, was, this is the way of tyrants. They just get rid of their enemies. So all of these children were being slaughtered left, right, and center. But Musa had to be saved. Musa had to be spared. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an angel to Musa's mother to Musa's mother, and told her the plan to save Musa. Right? The plan to save Musa was simple. Take your child, your infant, put him in a box, put that box in the river Nile, and let it go. That was it. That was all of the plan she was given. She wasn't told anything else. She wasn't told the continuation that this is how it's going to go. No. Put him in the box. Allah commanded you to put him in a box, put him in the Nile River, and let him go. Now, the Nile River is not some little, you know, bubbling brooks like we have here in, in Texas. The Nile River is, is something akin to the Mississippi. You know, it's not a river you just jump into. I spent a couple of years in a, in a, in a flat right in front of the Nile River on a, a road known as Sha'ri Kun in in, in uh, Cairo. It's not a, I, I never jumped in it. You know, I would see kids born and raised. I think you have to be born and raised in, in, in Egypt to jump in that river. But to place your child in, if you're a parent, you can understand the complexity of this. I have to put an infant in a box. I don't know where he's going and just put him in the Nile River. But Musa's mother had tawakkul. Tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She did not need to know the whole plan. She just knew that if Allah commanded her to do something, then she'd do it and Allah would take care of the rest of the plan. Now, 
What happens? She puts him in the box. The box starts floating down the Nile River. And where does this box end up? Usually in my talks, I ask for responses, but Juma, you can't speak. Where does this box go? This box arrives in Pharaoh's backyard. And now Musa's mother, even though she trusted in Allah, she also was a mother. She was a mother. So she sent her daughter to go and see where your brother goes. Go and look, go and, go and report to me what happens to him, right? Keep an eye on him. This is a mother's love. It's unequivocal. So the box goes to Fir'aun's backyard. Can you imagine if we were in today's world with this modern technology, right? And Musa's sister sends a, 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 a picture, a text message or a Snapchat or whatever have you to Musa's mother that, hey, look where this box went. This box went to the very backyard of the person whom you put him in the box to protect him from. You know, imagine if that was a movie uh, or a TV series going on. The box floats into Pharaoh's backyard. They show a big picture of his pal palace and then dun dun dun, we'll see you next week. All week long, we'll be like, oh, it's over. You know, that's it. That boy is done. That's it. It's over. The game's over. He went to the very place he was supposed to be protected from. Or if Musa's sister was able to tell her mother, this is where it went. Maybe, maybe she would have been like, you know, this is not what I agreed to. You know, this plan is not working out. No, no, no. no. I didn't agree to send him to the very person who's trying to kill him. Allah doesn't need you to know the whole plan. Allah doesn't need you to know the whole plan. He works in his own ways. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works in ways that you and I are unable to comprehend. This is why he says to have tawakkul in him. Trust him without an understanding because you can't grasp it. We know the, how that story goes. Fir'aun is found by who? Asi. The wife of Fir'aun who held Iman in her heart. And Asi convinced Fir'aun. She took this child and Allah gave her an immediate love for him, right? She took this child to Fir'aun. This is also shows you this is a little side lesson for our brothers is that your wife, for those of you who are married, and if you've been married for more than five, ten years, you know this already. And if you don't, learn it now. And if you're not going to get married, if you're not, and you're going to get married, learn this now. Your wife has a superpower. She has a superpower. That superpower is called the power of persuasion. That power of persuasion. When your wife really wants something, if she's been married to you five, ten, fifteen years, she knows you well enough, she's going to get what she wants, one way or the other. I've learned it's easier just to surrender early. Surrender early. And the battle is just is, is easier, much easier for you. So Fir'aun convinces through the power of persuasion for Fir'aun to adopt his own destruction. Not only does he adopt his own destruction, they tried to find a wet nurse for this child because you couldn't go to the store and buy formula. That's just not the way it worked. You had to find someone to breastfeed this child. So they brought one wet nurse after another, after another, after another. He wouldn't take from any of them. This is the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wouldn't take from any of them. And Musa's sister's watching this whole scenario, right? And they're getting very frustrated. So finally she sees an opening and she comes and says, Look, can I give you a suggestion of a woman whom I can bring and I, I, I can almost assure you that he will take from her. At that point, the child is dying. So they're like, you know, whatever, bring whomever. If it works, it works. So who does she go and get? She goes and get Musa's mother. She goes and gets his mother. His mother comes. Can you imagine probably her realization when she realizes where her son is? He's in the palace of Fir'aun. The very person who's trying to kill him, whom you sent to. He's in his house now. And you're being commanded to come. So she goes. And as soon as Musa sees his mother, of course, he starts taking from her. And then what happens? Now, Musa's mother is being paid because this was a job. She is being paid a salary. From the royal palace, she's being paid a royal salary. And Musa and her are put under royal guard. Look at the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Her and her son are being paid and put under royal guard for his protection. So not as only Fir'aun adopt his own destruction, he pays for it. He pays to protect it. He pays to raise it. And its mother. And we know that Musa would eventually raise up, leave Egypt and then be spoken to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sent back with his brother Harun and they would become the reason for the destruction of Fir'aun and the freedom of Bani Israel. The plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need to make sense to you. It does not need to make sense to you. Allah knows, He understands, everything is within His power, everything is within His grasp. Everything is working out exactly as He has commanded and planned it. Our job as believers is to have tawakkul.
to trust him to trust him no matter what it looks like no matter how it looks like it's going our command is to trust him he never says to understand me you have to understand my plan you have to comprehend it no just trust me i got this this is the plan of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it doesn't need to make sense to you there was once at the time of the wood a woman a woman right and this is from the israeli there's a time of the wood there was a woman she was a poor woman and she lived her life by sewing things and knitting and she would sew and knit things and take them to the market and sell them and from that money she would then buy enough food for her and her children for that day she was a widow and enough material to knit something for the next day and that's how she lived every single day day to day in and out that's how she lived one day she was on the way to the market and a bird came and snatched up her knitting snatched up that which she had to make for the next day and took off with it and now she has nothing to feed her children and days go by and her children are starving and she's starving this bird is acting upon what from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala birds don't have a free will they just do what Allah has commanded them to do so she goes into the court of Dawood and she lodges a complaint she says well first she asks a question she says is Allah just or is Allah unjust to his slaves it's a very strange question right so he asks why do you ask this question someone has to get to a point I know I do I do counseling every single day there has to be, when people ask certain questions like this, you need to know the why. There's a reason why this person is asking this question. What has happened to bring you to this point? So she explains herself, right? She explains herself and what happened. And, you know, I have nothing now. My children are starving. Is Allah just or is Allah unjust? As the, all of this is happening, some men come in. And they're carrying with them big bags of gold. And they come in a, it's a big commotion because, you know, they got these men, big bags of gold. They're not from here. And they come and just throw it at the feet of Dawood alayhi salam. And they say, this is sadaqah for Allah, for whomever you deem it to be uh, 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 necessary, whomever you will for. And so Dawood says, hold on a second. What, what, what is this story now? They say, we are merchants who travel by sea. And we were on our way from our last trip and it was successful. But our sail broke on our ship. And we could not navigate the waters. And we got caught in a storm. And we had no way to escape it. And we thought we were going to die. So we asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We were making dua for Allah. If he would save us from this. We would donate all of the proceeds. From this venture. For his sake. They said not long after making this dua. A bird flew by our boat. And dropped some knitting materials. And knitting supplies. That we were able to use to repair our sail. And thus make it to your land. And here we are fulfilling our oath to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Dawood looks at the woman. Yeah? He looks at the woman. And he asks her the same question she asked him. Is Allah just? Or is Allah unjust? Is Allah just or is Allah unjust to you? You have a Rabb who is working for you. On land, in the air, and at sea. So is Allah just or is Allah unjust? And he gives all of it to her and makes her a wealthy woman. Because this belongs to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this plan for you. You don't need to always understand. Sometimes we ask, Oh Allah, why me? Why are you putting me through such difficulties? Why are these tests happening? Because Allah has a plan. Allah has a reason. Nothing comes into your life. Nothing happens to you. Unless Allah has willed it and decreed it. Not a leaf falls from a tree. Nothing happens within this universe. Except it is perfectly in Allah's order. And the way He has willed it to be. Our job is simply to trust in Him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. When our Prophet وسلم, was surrounded in his house in Mecca by assassins. His house is surrounded. There's nowhere to go. They're going to kill him tonight. Allah orders him to leave. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He has no idea what the plan is. But he knows that Allah has commanded him to leave. So he leaves. He walks out of his door reciting from the Quran, blow some dust. And nobody even sees him. Nobody even sees him. They don't even watch him walk away. You don't need to know the plan. After that, he would meet Abu Bakr. Because Abu Bakr had stayed behind. You know, everybody else had made hijrah. This is the love. We'll talk about this in our upcoming series on 
on the companions promised paradise. Abu Bakr had such love for the Prophet ﷺ. He waited. He waited and he waited and he waited. And, he waited. and even the Prophet asked him, why are you waiting? And he, you know, he said, I can't leave without you. He said, just wait. Maybe Allah will give you a good companion to go with. And so he waited and he left with Abu Bakr. And they left at night. In the morning, the Quraysh find out that he's gone. When they find out that it's Ali sleeping in his bed. And look at the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ali lays in his bed willingly that night. Willingly. Ali radiallahu anhu wa Another one of the greatest men who have ever walked the face of this planet. Lays in his bed that night. Knowing very well that there are assassins going to come in and could possibly kill him. What did he say about that night? He said, I've never slept so peacefully. He said, that was the most restful night of sleep I have ever had in my life. With assassins surrounding. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan and order. As they're leaving, the Quraysh find out what happens. They send many people out to find him. They put a big reward out for him. A big reward. Everybody's looking all over the place for our Prophet to bring him back so they can kill him. Nobody can find him except for Saraqa ibn Malik ends up finding him. Saraqa finds him and sees him ahead of him with Abu Bakr. Right? Look at this plan. It's just how it's unfolding. Saraqa is chasing him and the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr see him. And so uh, uh, the Prophet وسلم, makes dua to Allah to protect them from Saraqa. And what happens? His horse falls and sinks into the sand and falls. And then he tells them and it's stuck. So he, he tells, Ya Muhammad, he, you see, they, they, they knew who this man was. Ya Muhammad, make dua to Allah, I won't chase you no more. So he frees him and then he starts chasing him again. This happens a couple of times, right? And then finally the Prophet وسلم, stops. And he says, Saraqa, how are you going to be? What is your condition going to be? When one day, when one day, you are given the bracelets of Kisra as bounty from the Muslim community. Saraqa's like, what in the world? This guy is being chased as a criminal. He has no army. He has no help. He's literally alone with Abu Bakr. And he's telling me that I'm going to be given the bracelets of Kisra. The greatest empire, one of the greatest empires the world has ever known. He leaves him at that point. He goes back in the Meccans and be like, just leave him. He's crazy. You know, we used to we used to joke about him being crazy. He's legitimately crazy. This man says, I'm going to be given the braces of Siraqa. What happens? At the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, when Khalid ibn Walid, the drawn sword of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings down the Persian empire, the Roman empire, and the bounty comes into the Muslim community. Saraqa had accepted Islam after Fatul Mecca. But Umar was going through the bounty. And he opened a box and he saw the bracelets that Kisra was famous for wearing. And he remembered the prophecy of the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, tell Saraqa, come here. This is the honor and dignity that Allah gives to those who trust him. He said, tell Saraqa, come here. And he said, do you remember Saraqa? Do you remember? When you were chasing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he told you that this would happen. And he himself put those bracelets on Saraqa. This is the plan of Allah Subhanahu You don't need to know how it's going to happen. You just need to know that if Allah says it will happen, it will happen. That's all that needs to be known. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he escapes Saraqa, what happens? The Meccans find him again. And they run into the cave of Fawr. They run into this little small cave. For those of you who have been there, you know it's very small, very small. And there's an opening underneath. Like literally, if you look up under, you can see all the people that are in it. So they hide in this cave because that's all there is. And the Meccans start coming closer. And what does Abu Bakr say to our Prophet Wasallam? He becomes scared, he becomes frightened, he's human. He says, oh messenger of Allah, if they look down at their feet, they're going to see us. They're going to find us. What does the Prophet Wasallam say to him? Oh Abu Bakr. What do you think is going to be the end result of two people whom the third is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What do you think is going to happen to two people whom the third is Allah? And of course, we know the very famous story that they weren't found. They weren't caught. And our Prophet sallallahu alayhi would go on. Brothers and sisters, you don't need to understand what's happening in the world. I know there's a lot of time we spend, we try to over uh, 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 analyze, you know, we try to uh, hypothesize, we try to look at the politics, we try to look at the dynamics, we try to figure out this is the way it's going to work. No, if they do this, look, it does not matter. 
whatever Allah's plan is for this world will be. Whatever Allah's plan for this ummah is, will be. It will be. We cannot escape it. We cannot escape it. The qadr of Allah is fixed. The only thing that can change it, the Prophet ﷺ said is dua. But did Allah make, know you're going to make that dua change? This is the, all the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything is already written. You know that very famous statement we say all the time, maktub, it's written. It's written and whatever is written with Allah is inescapable. It is inescapable. We don't need to know the plan. We just need to trust the planner. Because the planner is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Makaru wa makar Allah. They plan and Allah plans. Allahu khayrul maqireen. And Allah is the best of those who plan. Allah is the best of those who plan. So all we are responsible for is trusting Him. Trusting Him. Just trust Him. He knows what He's doing, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We just need to stand firm.